Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Clayton Duby, and it's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you to today's USC US China Institute webinar. Uh, we have with us today Neiman Fellow and Financial Times journalist Lucy Hornby, who's going to be speaking about COVID-19, which has you know, reconfigured our world. Uh, it's reconfigured our lives. We are doing this not from an auditorium at USC, but from our respective homes scattered across uh, North America and other places. So that's one sign of that. But if you think about just the dramatic change that has happened, this is a disease that within China took thousands of lives, within the United States has already taken more than 140,000 lives, that has uh, sent tens of millions of people in the United States to file for unemployment. And in China, you've got tens of millions, at least, people who have not yet been able to return to factories, even though China's economy has begun to rebound. There is so much to talk about. There have been political ramifications for this. Uh, there has been, there, we've also had issues of anti-Asian uh, violence and hateful language that has come about as a partial consequence of what has happened. Now, we're really fortunate to have with us Lucy Hornby. And I've been learning from Lucy's writing for a long time. I'm really a beneficiary of it. Uh, she's a Neiman Fellow at Harvard, but for 20 years, she lived in China. She first went to China, taught English in, of all places, Wuhan. And uh, we'll be going to Wuhan again in just a few minutes. But she subsequently became a journalist and has reported throughout China on a whole host of issues for Reuters and for the Financial Times. Uh, when she left China to take the position at Harvard, she was uh, the deputy bureau chief at, of the Financial Times in Beijing. In that capacity, she helped to lead important investigations into some of China's high-flying conglomerates and to look at what they were actually built upon, what they were seeking to do. I've read her work and listened to her on all sorts of topics. We brought her to USC in 2018, where she spoke about something that was really, really important and very poorly understood in the United States, the issue of soil pollution within China and the impact on agriculture and other things. She's been working on capital flows, including the role of international capital in China. Today, she'll be looking at, after the coronavirus, China and the United States. Uh, friends, wherever you are, put your hands together and welcome Lucy Hornby. So thanks again, Clay, for inviting me. And um, I wanted to talk tonight about how the coronavirus specifically uh, could change uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China. Um, we all know uh, that the your relationship is uh, one of escalating tension. Um, it was hard to put together this presentation this week because every day the headlines changed. Consulates were closed. Um, you see at the upper left of your screen, that's the Chinese consulate in Houston. Lower right is the American consulate in Chengdu. Um, students and scholars have been blocked. Journalists have been expelled. Um, and I think that as a journalist, it's been particularly painful um, to see individuals that we care about um, being caught up in the situation. But I think it's also very dangerous, um, especially for the US because we lose a lot of visibility into what's going on in China. On both sides in the US and China, security hawks and isolationists are setting uh, the policy vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, it's common now to talk about a cold war. Uh, and just this afternoon in uh, California, um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, gave a major speech uh, where he basically set things up as a Cold War. Um, but I think that there's another way you can look at it. And I think that the COVID uh, virus is showing up that there's an alternative explanation, and that is a power vacuum. Um, on the Ch American side, we have people who are um, orienting our foreign policy to be against China, but not necessarily to be for anything. 
Uh, on the Chinese side, I have a quote here from the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi um, about enhancing China's international influence under the guidance of Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy. Um, that is not a call to arms for many people, um, but I've decided to interpret it um, for you. I looked up what that meant. And basically it means um, accepting a historical inevitability. Uh, they don't say of what, but I believe that it is the historical trend um, of China being uh, the dominant power in Asia. Um, and of also grasping the big picture and not being distracted by details. Um, so it's not exactly an ideology that many in the world um, can sign up to uh, in a very different way than say the Cold War in the past where you had uh, two very competing, uh, very attractive ideologies. Um, another difference with the Cold War in the past is of course the Soviet Union and the United States uh, had virtually no economic integration, uh, the two blocs, um, whereas now we're in a situation uh, where we do have economic integration. Um, and one of the things that the Trump administration is trying to do is to unwind that. Again, I think that runs um, us into the risk of a power vacuum. For the purposes of this talk, I thought it would be interesting if we looked very specifically at the ways that COVID is shaping this um, relationship or its deterioration. Uh, lots of people have written about the relationship overall. Um, but I'm going to take the lens of COVID and sort of see how it changes things uh, and what it changes and um, how we can understand uh, what's happening to all of us uh, through that lens. So let's start with where COVID started, um, which is, as Clay mentioned, Wuhan, um, a city that I lived in for two years from 1995 to 1997. Wuhan is called the Detroit of China. Uh, it's an industrial center, um, a center for automotive, a uh, center for steel. Um, as those sectors have slowed down, the government has tried to transform it into a center for new technologies. Um, it is bang in the middle of China. It's where the Beijing-Guangzhou Railway crosses the Yangtze River. Uh, the river at Wuhan is a kilometer wide during the summer flooding season, which is happening right now. Um, so it's a place that's central, but also kind of easy to overlook um, when you talk about China. Uh, I have a picture here from the 90s, and at the time it was really hard to believe that Wuhan would be important internationally in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I thought I'd share this with you just to give you an idea of how quickly Wuhan has changed and also China itself. Um, you see on the upper left is my classroom back in 1995. Uh, it was a very poor city at the time, um, but full of people who were full of aspirations. Uh, second, the middle picture is uh, 2009 during a solar eclipse in Wuhan. Uh, you can see that people's uh, clothing and general health has improved tremendously. Uh, and then finally, a picture of Wuhan today. And those three young ladies really wouldn't be um, out of place in terms of their quality of life uh, in any other developed country in the world today. So there's been huge changes in China, huge changes in Wuhan. Um, in some ways, uh, China and Chinese people even feel that they've surpassed the rest of the world. And one of those ways is in transport and communications. Um, they have high speed trains already at the Wuhan railway station. Um, whereas it took me a day flight with a transfer and an overnight uh, train trip to get there 25 years ago. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed was that people in Wuhan really look towards the United States and towards the Western system in general uh, as a model for governance and as a model for uh, sort of an ideal of how society should be run. Um, and when the coronavirus first broke out, it was first identified in uh, late December of last year, uh, we saw that trust in Western institutions. We saw Chinese people, Chinese doctors, Chinese scientists reaching out, uh, trying to spread the alarm. Now, a lot of noise has been made about how the Beijing, the Chinese government, um, was trying to downplay the crisis at first. I think that is true. But it is also true that the Chinese citizenry, uh, and especially Chinese experts, had a great deal of trust in Western institutions. And they believed that if they spread the alarm to global institutions, um, that that could help stop this virus, not just in, within China, but help stop it from spreading internationally. Um, and I think that one of the first casualties of this virus has been that sense of trust and admiration uh, because Chinese people um, have 
excuse me, Chinese people have watched in alarm as the West has struggled with this virus as much as China did. Um, I'll have a quote here from Henry Kissinger, um, that when the COVID-19 pandemic is over, many countries' institutions will be perceived as having failed. Um, and a more recent quote from an op-ed that appeared at Haaretz earlier this month, uh, which basically said, noted that many sort of medium-sized countries have dealt well with this virus, but some of the largest and most admired countries in the world, uh, and including the EU, uh, have not, have not been able to step up to the plate. Um, so a quick timeline, back in January, Xi Jinping needed the endorsement of the United States, the UK, the WHO, uh, to endorse China's approach um, and reached out to the White House, to the UK, um, to have that sense that he was doing the right thing. By March, Chinese citizens were appalled to see that um, countries overseas were having as difficult time or worse um, as China had had. By April, China, having had a very draconian shutdown for three months, um, far more draconian than any other country, uh, declared victory at home and began promoting its model abroad. And as of July, um, in the United States, we are still struggling with this virus. There's no end in sight. We've had 4 million cases and 145,000 deaths. So what does this mean? I think one of the um, first impacts that the coronavirus will have is on sort of ideology, guiding all the ideology. Um, it has raised the question in many people's minds, uh, not least uh, those of Chinese citizens, um, whether authoritarian governments responded better. It also raises the question uh, for those Chinese citizens who were very disturbed by their own country's response or who were um, upset by the very draconian lockdown that came in, um, who should they look up to in response? And who should the rest of the world look up to? Uh, if authoritarian tactics appear to have worked, um, what is that, does that make the argument then that that system of government is an attractive one. Uh, COVID has exposed many of the rifts in American society. Um, those of us who are Americans knew they were there all the time, um, but COVID's kind of brought them out in the open uh, and for all the world to see. And that again raises a question, is democracy serving its own people? What does the United States stand for? Uh, these are very big, broad questions, but they are part of what informs our soft power. Um, and these are things that the COVID uh, has definitely brought into question. In terms of geopolitics, um, in Northeast Asia especially, countries that have had a long history of engagement with China, with the Communist Party uh, and the People's Republic of China, were some of the quickest uh, to respond and to not necessarily take the Chinese government's reassurances at their word. Uh, so Taiwan, Japan, Korea, all responded very quickly. Um, but you also have seen China using this virus and using the distraction um, of other countries to push its agenda in the South China Sea uh, and to push forward into that area where its neighbors in Southeast Asia are not nearly as strong uh, states as its neighbors in Northeast Asia. Um, another area in which COVID has affected geopolitics uh, the U.S. needs credibility to keep its security, the security balance in Asia that we've all become used to. Um, and you saw in South Korea, the U.S. Army was very quick to adopt many of the same protocols as the South Koreans had. Uh, and the U.S. Army in South Korea did pretty well on COVID. However, the U.S. Navy, which we rely on um, to keep uh, the freedom of navigation and to keep open various open water agreements uh, in the South China Sea, among other places in the Pacific, the U.S. Navy proved very vulnerable uh, to COVID and the Navy, um, Navy hierarchy did not respond as quickly or as effectively as the Army did in South Korea. In terms of geopolitics in Europe, um, COVID has exacerbated a trend that we've been reporting on in the Financial Times for a long time. Uh, and that is this peeling away of Eastern and Southern Europe from the EU from NATO. Um, it's an agenda that is uh, set by Russia, but enabled by China. Um, and you, we have seen that in action for a while. Uh, COVID has sped it up. Uh, China was able to uh, give the appearance of helping all these countries um, through mask diplomacy. In other words, a very um, overt show of delivering goods and supplies. And the Western European countries, uh, the big European nations, 
weren't able to counter um, with the same degree of support that their smaller neighbors were looking for. In terms of global institutions, another geopolitical area where um, COVID is definitely um, exposing weaknesses that were there. Um, there have been tussles between the US and China and the EU for some time now over the WTO, the WHO, um, but the COVID, uh, the response of WHO to China's initial statements on COVID um, undermined the WHO's credibility and pushed the United States um, to call his bluff. The problem is that when you eliminate or erode these international institutions, neither the US nor China is offering better alternatives. Neither side is offering some other model um, for global governance or for even global cooperation to replace these institutions uh, that they both find flawed. Uh, another thing that COVID has definitely done, um, I hear I have a picture, you'll forgive me, from uh, Massachusetts where I'm living, uh, but where the Patriots had to fly their plane to get supplies for the state of Massachusetts when we had our first COVID um, peak of COVID outbreak. Um, what the COVID has done has uh, really highlighted something that the White House has been um, warning about for some time, and that is the dangers of having your supply chain concentrated in one country uh, that doesn't necessarily share your goals. Uh, when COVID first hit in January and February, COVID, China effectively nationalized all of its um, medical supply uh, production, and it vacuumed up medical supplies from around the world. Uh, that resulted in the rest of the world being short on supplies when the crunch came in the rest of the world. Um, and it really revealed the flaws in the just-in-time um, supply chain theories and uh, over-reliance on, um, on China as a, a source of supply. Um, now that's something that Japan and Korea in particular have been very aware of over the last decade. They have moved um, to move a lot of their supply chain out of China or at least duplicate it elsewhere. Um, and in the United States, the Trump administration has been pushing American companies very hard to do the same. Um, another impact of COVID that I think none of us would have expected three or four years ago is the way p medicine has become politicized. Uh, we used, we're used to thinking of medicine as a, as a neutral, as a benign, as even a positive force around the, um, for humanity. Um, but COVID is really turning medicine into a battleground for states. Uh, a lot of people talk about, well, who's going to be the first to have a vaccine? Um, there are reports about different countries hoovering up supplies or, you know, monopolizing certain drugs. And uh, most recently in the past week, there have been allegations of cyber theft and other spying to try to steal, um, steal coronavirus, um, coronavirus advances. Um, in China, you've had a big push um, for an indigenous innovation that could beat this at home. Uh, so in both cases, you've got the state becoming very involved in a field that we traditionally don't associate uh, with state competition. Uh, I had, uh, I think, 20 or 30 minutes, so I'd like to keep this brief um, and give enough time for Q&A as I can. But um, I wanted to end with this picture. Uh, it's in Wuhan, so we've come full circle. Uh, and I just love this picture because I think it really exposes so many things about the Chinese system and how the Chinese system has responded to COVID. Um, this was the first visit of Xi Jinping to Wuhan. Um, normally politicians, of course, like to uh, present themselves in a disaster zone. But in his case, uh, you can see the extreme measures um, and the extreme uh, brittleness, I would say, of the way that he's trying to simultaneously show his um, show his empathy or his response to a suffering city, um, but also keep himself well protected. And so he, there he is in a single room with masks, six feet distance from a screen, waving at patients and doctors who are in a hospital that is not there. Um, I mean, not in his immediate vicinity. And to me, I've, I've ended this um, with this picture, partly because I think that we're all, um, looking at China from the outside. Uh, we're all trying to figure out from the outside um, 
what China is doing, how it might impact us, how we should respond. Um, but I think this picture just shows how very different the Chinese system is, uh, how brittle it is, um, how focused on propaganda it is, because of course, um, the propaganda machine just said that Xi Jinping had come to Wuhan um, to you know, supervise the COVID response. Um, and that leads us into um, many of the questions. As journalists, we like to approach uh, stories from the point of view of questions rather than answers. And uh, Orville Schnell, um, who we all admire for his, um, his mastery of Chinese politics, he posed the first question here saying, what do I think is the biggest um, point of tension um, or the point that's been exposed by COVID. And I think that it is the fact that there's so much we don't know about what's going on in China. Um, we know what's happening here in the US. We know our weaknesses. We are an open society uh, that tends to thrash out any of our problems in public view. Um, but we don't know what's happening in China. We can guess that it has impacted the Chinese um, economy pretty severely. Um, we can guess that it has, similarly to the US, it has um, reduced the voices of people who want engagement or people who would naturally um, be interacting between the two societies uh, in a way that is not um, only focused on national security, um, but we don't know. And uh, unfortunately, with the expulsion of journalists, uh, with both sides choosing to make journalists as a pawn in this game, um, we have lost a great deal, a window of insight into what China is doing. Um, we've also lost with the um, cut in traveling and with the various dangers of crossing national borders nowadays, um, we've lost that ability of citizens to reflect back to each nation what's going on in the other nation. Um, the program that I went to teach uh, English in China um, has suspended its fellowships in Asia this year uh, due to uncertainties over visas and over the disease. Um, you know, it's not a step that I criticize, but it's yet another iteration of the fact that we have less contact, less visibility into these societies, and we are more and more reliant on what each side is trying to show each other through propaganda, through bluster, um, and not through a lot of information. So I think that that's a very dangerous position to be in. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that COVID has um, exposed to us. Um, and I think it's going to be something that we have to be very consciously aware of our own blindness as we try to navigate this problem. Uh, so with that, I told Clay I'd be short and uh, I'd like to move on to Q&A. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thanks uh, also for going ahead, going ahead and addressing Orville's question. Orville's a good friend. He's a member of the US-China Institute uh, board and of course directs the Center for uh, Looking at US-China Issues at the Asia Society. So we're glad that he's joined and asked some questions. We have a number of others that have come to us and I'll start asking some of those in just a second. But first, uh, because of your deep experience and your wide experience across China, you have a sense of where Chinese people are, where cultural norms and these sorts of things exist that not many Americans uh, you know, uh, have, uh, even though they may, you know, traveled to China, study China, read about China. Now you mentioned a power vacuum at the very outset. And part of that uh, refers to the United States withdraw from international institutions and moving away from alliances and things like that. But is there also a power vacuum in the sense that although China is moving into international organizations and been very active with mass diplomacy and things like that, that it's not forged real enduring alliances, that it hasn't played that role. Uh, one person in the Q&A section asked about the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, somebody else might ask about the Asian uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. Is China moving in to that power vacuum? So I think that's certainly, um, that's the fear of some people. Um, 
And I also think that it would be fair to say that would be an expectation, you know, as a country becomes uh, this big uh, and this dominant economically, um, you would expect that country to have greater influence internationally, um, sort of naturally. Uh, I think the point that I was trying to make is that um, as the institutions that we've been used to dealing with uh, since the Second World War, as those are hollowed out um, or as those are abandoned um, by the United States, um, China isn't really proposing any alternatives. Um, you have the what they call the Belt and Road, but it's not an institution, actually. Um, it's, it's what it is for those who don't know. Um, basically, China, again, as one might expect, um, starting in the late 90s, began um, investing in many other countries' natural resources, um, in part in an effort to uh, feed China's ex extremely fast growth in those times. Um, that investment in natural resources kind of morphed into um, investment in, um, in infrastructure. So whether it be power lines, railroads, roads, um, all the kind of infrastructure ports um, that China had built up itself um, to a great extent. They started building in other countries as well. Um, and then kind of retroactively, they kind of bundled it all together and called it the Belt and Road. Um, but it's not exactly an institution. It's sort of a uh, one China scholar, actually Scott Kennedy at CSIS in DC, he called it a Christmas tree um, that you can hang all sorts of initiatives on it. And I would add that you can hang, hang all sorts of fears on it as well. Um, but one of the biggest problems or challenges of it is uh, twofold. One is that it is a program to basically export Chinese overcapacity. So uh, to keep Chinese order books going um, in building new things in other countries. Um, but the sort of fallacy behind it is that in China in the 80s and 90s, basically anything you built would be used uh, because China had been so bizarrely held back from its natural development, and it had so many people. Um, the problem is that other countries are asked to fund Belt and Road um, through their own national accounts. Um, it's a debt financed program, um, but many of them don't have the growth potential that China had, either because they're already as wealthy as China was at the time or is now, uh, or because they just don't have the population and, and the demand, inherent demand. Um, so what it is, it's, it's a agglomeration of infrastructure and structured financing projects, um, but it doesn't have any institutional um, structures that go along with it. Um, and so I think that that's why, although people say, well, there is the Belt and Road, well, yes, there is, um, but it doesn't come close to being an alternative to the global institutions um, that we're all used to. And uh, if the US does withdraw completely from those global institutions, it's not very clear um, how they would function or, or whether they would function uh, particularly well. So that was the point I was trying to make that, that China is present. It's certainly an enormous economy. It certainly has huge international influence. I don't question that, but it, it hasn't been able to offer that kind of institutional structure. Well, and to build it in such a way so that the benefits for other places in participating are obvious and fairly immediate. So uh, you've done a wonderful job taking us through the crisis, how it played out in China. And you end, of course, with um, uh, Xi Jinping, you know, waving into a television camera and, you know, as socially distant as you can be from the patients and from uh, the first uh, the first line medical care people. And you stressed uh, the role of propaganda. And we've talked a little bit about that, but could you go a little bit deeper into the question of uh, China's put out its message uh, internally and externally, that it succeeded, that it responded, that this really did demonstrate the effectiveness of the Chinese way of doing things. Is it your sense uh, from social media and things like that, that these claims have credibility within China? You already raised questions outside of China and you 
focused on Serbia and other places where uh, the Thanks China uh, campaign uh, was undertaken. But what is the impact of this messaging? Or is it so pervasive that it raises more questions than it addresses? Well, I think one of the strengths of the Communist Party ever since the days of Mao, um, ever since the 1930s really, has been this ability to, uh, the immense attention that it gives to propaganda um, and the immense attention that it gives to, after the fact, declaring things a success uh, and getting other people's testimonials uh, in that regard. Um, and that's something that, of course, fascinates people and frustrates people who um, like to study these sort of things like yourself. Um, I think that for me, the most interesting barometer has been, um, you know, friends I know in China um, who initially in, uh, in January, as they saw this virus raging through Wuhan, as they saw um, open infighting in the leadership on how to respond, um, you saw kind of horrific scenes of people lined up in um, hospital corridors, um, you know, and, and that kind of brought out all the complaints that everybody always had about, um, about China and about how other countries run. And basically it was all the things they didn't like. And then when China clamped down, um, they decided to just shut it all down. I mean, they really shut it down. People were locked in their apartments um, to a degree that it's hard for an American to imagine. Um, and again, that wasn't hugely popular with most people. Um, but on the other hand, there was, they were very effective at putting out the message that this was something, a sacrifice that the citizens needed to make for the overall health of the nation. And, you know, there was a lot of good natured grumbling. Um, there was a lot of genuine anger. Um, but I think a lot of Chinese people also accepted that argument and and felt that that was their duty. Um, and it's an argument that has been conspicuously absent in the United States. Um, you know, so very different from, you can imagine, say, in the 1950s or the 1940s, when American politicians might have made the same argument to Americans that, okay, we sacrifice now, but it's for the good of everybody, and we're going to make it through and get this over with. Well, that messaging hasn't happened in the U.S., but I think it was effective. I mean, I think a lot of Chinese people genuinely felt, okay, well, you know, we're, we're going to do our part. Um, and, you know, the sort of positive patriotism or nationalism in China works very well in that de degree. And then the third uh, sea change I kind of felt in attitudes is that now um, there's not a lot of travel between regions in China, but within regions, you know, Beijing is kind of a big bubble, Shanghai is a big bubble. Um, and so people within those bubbles are starting to move around very freely. Um, normal life has not fully uh, resumed, but it feels much more normal. It's certainly more normal than being locked in your house. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are, and then people look at what's happening in the US um, and you know, don't forget, of course, social media tends to make everything look much more dramatic than it is. Um, and also Chinese uh, news also tends to focus on what they call the Luan or the chaotic things going on overseas. And every Chinese I know is completely horrified, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, even those who were very pro-American um, are starting to say things like, well, you know, maybe we did the right thing. Uh, maybe our government was more competent than we gave it credit for. Uh, you hear that a lot. Um, maybe, maybe we are more competent than we thought we were. Um, and so I think that's been a huge sea change in attitudes among Chinese people. Um, it may have been uh, somewhat um, encouraged by the propaganda, but I think it's a genuine feeling that people are, Chinese people are f perfectly capable of coming to their own conclusions. Uh, so those are the three stages that I've seen. Yeah, the, we've definitely seen as the United States has you know, failed to cope adequately with the with the challenge, uh, many in China saying, "Well, okay, uh, we were unhappy, but at least uh, we feel relatively safe." And I know that many of your friends back in China have probably offered you masks and expressed worry and uh, advised you to to be cautious and all of these kinds of things, as you know, my friends and contacts have done. Uh, so that definitely, definitely has. Uh, resounded. And you see also, though, in social media 
Here I'm thinking of short videos uh, on Shigua and other platforms where you do have some travelogue sorts of things. And it's striking to see people going out and seeing things. But a lot of these places, the parks and whatnot, are admission free. And the reason they're admission free is because there's no one there, right? And so trying to get a sense on how life is coming back is, is a challenge, but we do have a variety of windows. Now, one of the things that you raised uh, is how China, uh, Russia initiated the effort to kind of uh, break up European, uh, the European Union and uh, other countries in Europe to try to splinter them off. And you say that China has helped to facilitate that, partly because China's economic resources are so much greater and has been investing as well as doing these other things. Do you think uh, that it's an absence of effort? You highlighted the larger European countries, presumably you know, making reference to you know, Italy, Germany, France, uh, that they haven't done enough to you know, hold these other countries in. What do you think is at work here and how effective has the Chinese message and Chinese money been? So um, this predates COVID by quite some time, but the whole idea of the EU, um, the EU experiment um, is a bit artificial. And um, you know, we saw it definitely with the Euro crisis um, back in, uh, what was it, 2012, 2011, um, that you, you have a, a kind of a funny situation where the needs and um, preferences, both fiscally, uh, in terms of labor, in terms of social policy, but especially in terms of fiscal and currency, are very, very different between the core, core EU countries and the peripheral EU countries. Um, and so, you know, I had a, a bureau chief at Reuters who he'd come in at 7 a.m. and kind of give us all a, a teach in every morning during the EU crisis as to all the reasons why the euro um, was a very artificial construct. Um, but, you know, I think it, it is a social experiment that worked well when the core countries were able to um, financially uh, sustain the peripheral countries. But it started to crack, and not because of China. It just started to crack when the, Euro cri the global financial crisis followed by the Euro crisis kind of revealed the limits of the ability of those wealthier countries to uh, sustain or keep afloat the periphery. Um, so, so it's not because of China, and it's not because of the coronavirus. But I think China has been very um, cleverly opportunistic in how it's engaged. Um, it, has, it was offered... Um, to be fair, it was offered um, a lot of European infrastructure at fire sale prices, um, particularly in peripheral countries, and China snapped them up. Um, they uh, went out of their way to buy many small banks uh, in European countries, um, especially Chinese private, com private companies, um, as a financing tool. Um, and also because they needed the bigger reserves of those banks. So there's been enormous uh, interest legitimate interest, um, but not maybe for the reasons that the European regulators want um, in those European uh, financial infrastructure, as well as uh, in European um, physical infrastructure. Uh, but then you also see China coming in and kind of uh, doing a little crony capitalism, I suppose, or crony assistance um, to pro-Chinese or especially pro-Russian politicians in Eastern Europe. Um, and that's where I think the term peeling away uh, is very um, is very apropos because that those efforts and those financial assistance are heavy on the propaganda and light on the economic rationale. Um, whereas other investments, you can see the logic why China would be doing it. Um, and so that that's a story that we've been covering a lot at the Financial Times. Um, not being an American paper, we're based in London. Uh, we try to really balance our reporting on world affairs and not make it always U.S. versus somebody else. Um, and definitely the Europe-China dynamic has been extremely interesting. Absolutely. And you're reporting, uh, for example, just on HNA and some of these other, other operations in Europe and elsewhere has been really, really important. We have a couple of questions from, from the audience, and I would encourage people to go ahead and 
you can still submit questions. Click on that Q&A button at the bottom. But a couple people, uh, they heard you point out about the response of some other countries to the COVID-19 crisis. And you mentioned, for example, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and a couple people have say, are say, saying, isn't this the counter to the notion that democratic, uh, democratic states can't respond so effectively? And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more of how those countries, how those regions managed to succeed. Yeah, I mean, I think different countries have had different approaches. Um, I actually covered Mongolia, too, when I was in, um, in China. And so Mongolia's response was just to shut the borders. Um, you know, they didn't, they knew they couldn't handle a major outbreak. And so they moved to stop one. Um, but, you know, more sophisticated and wealthier societies such as Taiwan, um, Japan, South Korea, um, you know, they, they have a lot of cultural affinities with China. So they have, um, and they have decades of suspicion of the PRC. Um, and so those kind of combined together that when the outbreak was first happening in Wuhan, those countries moved very, very quickly uh, to try to screen and track um, people coming in. Um, at first, South Korea looked like it might have lost control. They had a um, sort of a church, um, which had a big missionary presence in Wuhan, um, and which was the center of an outbreak. Um, but they seem to have been able to kind of isolate that very quickly by moving very fast. Um, and I think one of the things that allowed them to do that is that they have a population who's very attuned to what's happening in their neighboring countries in Asia, um, and a population that was um, willing to go along uh, with the measures they imposed. I mean, they did not impose draconian lockdowns the way China did, um, but they did have contact tracing um, very uh, quickly and also very um, painstakingly. Um, and they had a population that was uh, very disciplined in its, abil in its willingness to cooperate with that. Um, whereas, you know, in Europe or in the US, you know, I think in January, I mean, even I, I was watching the stories, but it was kind of like, oh, it, you know, it's happening over there, not here. Um, and so the population kind of had a vague idea something was going on somewhere else. Um, the experts were very concerned, but didn't seem to be able to communicate that concern effectively to the population. And uh, the government didn't swing into action for six to eight weeks. Um, so you had a very, very different societal responses. Yeah, and in the United States, in addition to uh, the federal government, the central government uh, being slow to respond, you had this inconsistent uh, response across the states that we, and even within states where today we have uh, mayors and governors in dispute over what, what kinds of measures to, to implement. Now, you just mentioned, for example, uh, South Korea and Taiwan and Japan, and I'd like to highlight uh, a social cultural aspect of the response to the COVID-19 crisis. In all these places, it's long been the norm that when you were sick or if you wanted to prevent uh, getting sick, you wore a mask. You'd put on a mask, you know, riding your bike, in stores, on public transport. And so that was part of the culture. And I was wondering if you could say maybe a little bit more about that. One of the, question, one of the questions uh, that people have submitted has to do with, uh, you know, dietary habits and uh, that sort of thing it has to do with wet markets, essentially. And these are, of course, present in many, many places. And many Americans think that that's the source of the issue. Uh, and I was wondering if you could expand on just the, the cultural norms that made response more effective in these places. Can I answer the wet market thing? Please go right ahead. So um, I think, you know, when the virus first broke out, people, it, you know, it was traced initially to a wet market um, in Wuhan, although not uh, patient zero, interestingly. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was initially a lot of, um, I would say mean comments on social media about, oh, well, you know, these wet markets are filthy and people eat bats. So I've lived in Wuhan for two years. I've never seen a single person eat a bat. I've never heard of anybody eating bats. 
Um, and so I think that that would be step one to, you know, kind of disentangle the idea that it was, you know, some habit of eating weird creatures. Um, there can be exotic creatures um, in um, wet markets in China uh, and endangered creatures. And that's something that actually Chinese environmental activists are trying to mobilize against, um, to their credit. There's a, a movement in China to stop eating um, exotic creatures of any description and particularly endangered creatures. Um, Yao Ming, the famous uh, Houston basketball player, um, is actually leading the charge on shark fin, uh, not to eat shark fin. Um, and, you know, other Chinese environmental groups, they're often small, they're often underfunded, they get pressure from the government, but they're trying to push um, to respect uh, exotic creatures and, and not contribute to their endangerment. Um, but the counter of that, of course, is that in traditional Chinese medicine, um, there's sort of this perception that the stranger or more exotic the creature, the kind of better its chi or its health benefits are. And that's proven very, very difficult to eradicate. Um, and ironically, the wealthier China gets, the harder it is to eradicate because with um, many people had these ideas, but certainly couldn't afford some of these creatures 20, 30 years ago. Uh, now they've got the money, so they want to try. Um, but anyway, I think that's kind of neither here nor there. Um, I just wanted to address the issue of exotic animals specifically, um, but I don't think anybody was eating bats. No. And, <laughs> and, and while the virus, uh, you know, may have traveled from one species to another, it's not, you know, uh, it, it's not through the consumption process that that happens. Right. Now, what you do have, you know, when you have animals in cages uh, in oh, a small space, yeah. many of them are ill or, or you know, then... The, the problem is that that can create, can create, doesn't always create. And in this case, I don't think they've proven um, that this was the vector, but it can create a vector where a uh, viral load can mix from one species to another, especially with weakened caged uh, animals in poor condition and with a lot of fecal matter and blood and, you know, everything in one place. Um, that can be a vector for illness. Um, it probably was in the SARS outbreak. Um, you can also have uh, sometimes it, when bird flu, when you have bird flu outbreaks in China, there is often a wet market vector. Um, and just because, you know, there's kind of a lot of bodily fluids in one spot. Um, uh, but in the defense of wet markets, um, Asians care very much about the freshness of their food and the cheapness of their food. And, you know, nothing beats a nice fresh vegetable or a fresh chicken um, that you can get in a wet market that you cannot get um, in a supermarket. I mean, in supermarkets, the meat, just like here, it might be old, it might be rubbery, it may have been frozen and unfrozen many, many times. Uh, and so people feel very strongly that you get a better price and a better quality uh, if you go to these fresh markets. Um, now, another misperception is that uh, ever since the um, bird flu outbreaks of about 10, 10, 15 years ago, China has really cr clamped down on live poultry markets, um, which were often a vector for disease. So in other words, you'd come there and there's your chicken. You pick the chicken, it's still squawking. Somebody dumps it, kills it, dumps it in some water and um, defeathers it and guts it for you on the spot and then hands you your chicken. Um, many Chinese miss those days. Uh, but for the most part in big cities, that doesn't exist anymore, and largely because of the bird flu outbreaks that there were. Um, so your average wet market that the average citizen encounters will have um, probably frozen fish. It'll have live fish. Um, it might have uh, fresh meat. In other words, not frozen meat, but not alive meat either. Yeah, it'll recently have, slaughtered. Correct. It'll have eggs. It'll have vegetables. Um, and people like the experience of shopping there, um, including myself. Um, so that, that's why, you know, the sort of fascination. There's, there's not a supermarket culture um, the way there is here in the United States. Uh, but it really is not all exotic animals either. And definitely the Chinese health authorities kind of respond with every outbreak. Um, when it comes to COVID, it's not clear at all that this is where the vector of the disease um, moving from bats, uh, which were located in southeast, uh, southwest China, uh, to humans. It's not at all clear that the wet market is where this happened. 
However, it is certainly very possible that an infected person got to the wet market mm -hmm. and then from the wet market spread it very easily because they are very uh, damp places. Uh, they have a lot of water, a lot of fluid, um, and especially in the winter when people naturally have chest colds and, you know, there's kind of a lot of phlegm. Um, it's, it's kind of a place where you could see that in one infected person could easily transfer things to other and other people infect other people um but we i'm, I'm sorry if, if i could pull you away from the market uh <laughs> i know i know that in many for many of our viewers it's it's uh it's dinner time and they would love to uh, continue to shop with you in the market <laughs> but we have a couple of people who are raising questions about china's internal politics and so my former US, uh, usc colleague david carl raises one of these uh, our board member, Susan Shirk from UCSD, raises one of these, looking at the internal politics. And Susan, for example, asks you, uh, what is your sense about resistance to Xi Jinping and to the agenda that Xi Jinping has laid out? And she specifically asks about the business and political elite. Uh, David Carl was ask, asking about the dynamics at work within those circles as well. Okay, um, so first of all, I should say that I'm, I've learned far more from Susan than I expect that she would learn from me, but um, I'll answer the question quickly. Um, I think, you know, like everything in China, it's multi-layered. Um, I think that many people share with Xi Jinping a desire for China to be great. Um, and so whether or not they agree with his methods or his approach, you know, there's a fundamental, whether you want to call it patriotism or nationalism or sense of destiny or a sense of history, um, that that is a shared value among Chinese people, that they believe that China uh, historically is the dominant power in Asia and in the future should be the dominant power in Asia. Um, so when she talks about this sort of nationalist project, you know, he's not going to get a lot of people disagreeing with him on principle. Uh, what he does generate an enormous amount of distaste is uh, in his methods. Um, many people liked the kind of more liberal, more open, flourishing sense of society that was going on in China until he took over. Uh, many people enjoyed um, the difference of opinion. They enjoyed learning more about their own history. Uh, they enjoyed the freedoms that they enjoyed. Um, and so there's been a lot of resistance, um, both quietly, privately, and sort of quasi-openly to a lot of the initiatives that he's put out, um, which are focused on getting the Communist Party to be front and center in everybody's life again. Um, and, you know, it's hard to find people who are truly enthusiastic about that one. Some people more so, some people less so, but you know, especially in the early years of his reign, um, many private business people were open in their distress over this. And many um, mid-level bureaucrats that I knew were surprisingly open too about, um, you know, sort of their, their distaste for the, the project, should, shall you say. Um, nowadays, I think fewer and fewer people would voice that openly. Um, but I also think, you know, as I said earlier, there, there's a certain respect um, that I think uh, she and the party have earned um, in this six to seven months. Um, initially, there was a lot of resistance and a lot of anger over this draconian methods, but you know, a lot of Chinese now kind of give a grudging respect to that, even people who are, are not uh, big fans of the party. And so I think that if we as outsiders don't recognize that, um, or if we think it's all propaganda or all, um, you know, sort of an authoritarian state forcing this point of view, um, that would be a misreading. Yeah, it, a misreading that might lead uh, to policies that would just simply be inappropriate. Uh, they aren't likely to, to change uh, that shared sense of making China, you know, uh, better, improving China and doing those kinds of things. Uh, several people in the in the Q and A section have asked the question about the deterioration of of uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China. Some referring to actions by Xi Jinping, others referring to 
uh, President Trump and some others focusing on actions that China has taken within its borders towards Uyghurs and others, as well as external actions, for example, in the South China Sea. Uh, it's hard to assess uh, something that's so fluid, but to what extent do you think, you know, this is action reaction and to what extent is all of this really to be expected uh, for the two largest economies in the world uh, as they butt up against each other? So I think we can kind of um, rewind slightly and uh, just say, okay, you know, let's say that uh, we had no ideological um, disagreements whatsoever, um, but you have one country who's suddenly becoming a lot more powerful and, you know, asking for more elbow room in the sandbox. You know, I think that that is a disruptive um, circumstance under under any any circumstances. Um, it's something that a professor here at Harvard, Graham Allison, at the Kennedy School, he wrote the Thucydides Trap. Um, uh, basically, the idea that a rising power that is asking for more uh, space, more resources, more voice, um, will naturally trigger uh, a sort of a reaction uh, by the dominant power, um, which in this case is the United States. Um, so I think that that's a very real phenomenon and would be real no matter who was in the driver's seat. Okay. So, but then we get to uh, the fact on the Chinese side um, that you have a person who came into power and who has really imposed things that we had not seen since the Maoist era. And um, those are the mass incarceration of, an, of a people on the basis only of their ethnicity and religion. Um, and that, that's a Stalinist or a Maoist gulag is what he's recreated. Um, you have a noticeable chilling uh, in terms of people's ability to express opinions. Um, and, you know, I think, again, let's not underestimate uh, that there's always been censorship in China, of course, but... You know, there was a lot of discussion and debate that was going on uh, before she came in, and uh, that was viewed as a threat by the party. And so he's moved to shut that down. Um, and I think all of those moves kind of make people more worried and afraid about what are the motives. Um, you mentioned the Belt and Road earlier. Again, um, we would expect a country that is more powerful to have a greater international influence and cast a greater shadow. Um, you know, we would have had to accommodate that one way or another. But when it appears to be uh, married to these sort of illiberal policies um, and a sort of a pursuit of an economic system that's being exported that seems inevitably to lead to debt dependency among the weaker countries that it involves, um, that would inevitably, I think, have raised a lot of worries and made it much harder to be sympathetic to China. You know, there are a lot of people, yourself, myself, um, Dr. Shirk, who, you know, have gotten a lot of joy in their lives of in their engaging with China. But it's hard to do that when you look at something, especially like the Uyghur um, situation. You know, it's, it's hard. We can't sign on to that, you know. And then the third factor is that you've got on the American side, um, people who've come in uh, after the global financial crisis revealed the degree to which many Americans have been left behind. Um, and a lot of those jobs, uh, the manufacturing sector has moved uh, overseas and in particular to China, you can't deny that. Um, and so I think when you then have those two factors, you know, uh, on the U.S. side, a group of people who view China as a national security threat, but also as a um, a threat to their voters. Um, and then on the Chinese side, where you again have a nationalist uh, party authoritarian attitude coming back in, that's when you start to get action, reaction, action, reaction, and the downward spiral that we're seeing. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank you for being with us and for our audience. I will close off in just a couple of minutes, but I can't let Lucy go without returning to the question of journalists and these sorts of things. Now, you've been away from Beijing for a while, and I'm 
just curious, just curious uh, that living in the United States and as a consequence, uh, you know, having a greater sense of what people know, what they don't know, the assumptions they have, these kinds of things. How is your time back in the United States, and you all often had home leave every year and things like that, so I'm, I'm not suggesting you were on a different planet, but how has your time here changed what you think about doing when you return to China as a journalist? Well, it's certainly been an education. I left um, the U.S. right after I graduated, and although I did move back occasionally, I, I've lived most of my um, the past most of my adult life in Asia. Um, I think it's been a humbling experience. I mean, certainly attempting to sign up for car insurance, health insurance, <laughs> and everything in the course of three weeks uh, gives you a lot of perspective about what Chinese migrant workers go through when they try to get their paperwork in order. Uh, so I think it's been a bit humbling because we tend to report on the travails of, of foreign people trying to navigate their bureaucracy, uh, but trying to navigate our own was certainly a revelation to me. Um, I think also, you know, I think you don't, when you're overseas, you naturally um, kind of hold a candle in your heart for your own country, right? You see it in its best possible light. You want it to be the best possible country it can be. Um, and this year has really been a year of reckoning, I think, for all Americans in terms of, um, you know, what are the flaws in our own system, whether it be race, whether it be class, whether it be uh, the people who've been um, not uh, not fully invested in the economy over the, or squeezed out of the economy over the last 10 years. You know, and that wasn't something, living overseas, you know, and coming back for a vacation, you tend to keep an idealized version in your head. Um, I also think uh, one thing that's been really heartbreaking is I know uh, the Beijing press corps, the American press corps in Beijing and the foreign press corps more broadly, are people who are really very dedicated um, to explaining China to the outside. And it's been very heartbreaking to see those people used as pawns uh, between China and the U.S. I think we have shot ourselves in our foot um, by uh, limiting our ability to see into China, uh, by picking the fight on these grounds. I think the Chinese have also shot themselves in the foot um, because the American journalists and the foreign journalists more broadly have done a lot to humanize and make more sympathetic the Chinese people um, in the eyes of their readership. And there's a lot of built-in sympathy for the Chinese people writ, writ large among the American people. And I think that that's because of us. Um, so, you know, for the Chinese, those of you who don't know, uh, since January, I think about over 20 American journalists have been expelled from China uh, in retaliation for the United States having the number of v journalist visas it grants to the Chinese state media. Um, Many of those people were married to Chinese people. Many of them had lived in China, had pets in China, had apartments in China, um, had savings in China. You know, so it was personally heartbreaking for them. Um, but it also means we've lost a real window on China. Um, and many, many more foreign correspondents have not been expelled, but they've been locked out because they happen to be overseas when the visa restrictions and the COVID uh, travel restrictions hit. Um, so it's it's personally very upsetting, um, but I also think nationally it's a real problem. Um, we're flying blind and the Chinese have lost some of their best friends in terms of explaining their country to everyone else. Um, yeah, the, the people with deep networks within China that were able to bring China to life, to take it beyond uh, you know, black and white kind of depictions of the place, many of them have you know, uh, been been compelled to leave. Now, you mentioned, for example, flooding. And I consume a lot of Chinese news. And so my Chinese news feed is full of raging waters, of towns being submerged, of entire parking lots of cars underwater and th this sort of thing. And this has not received a lot of attention. Uh, Alice Su for the Los Angeles Times had a terrific article about it recently, but I suspect that the vast majority of Americans have not been aware of this dominant story. Now, part of it is natural uh, with a crisis that's already taken better than 140,000 lives that that would be front and center, but missing some of the things, these giant developments that affect millions upon millions of people uh, has been missed. 
And I'm not saying that that's a, a consequence of expelling these people. Part of it is just our news bandwidth here in the United States, uh, the relative lack of coverage of the greater world. I, maybe I'm, I'm uh, pontificating here, but I'm wondering for you coming in, you work for an internationally focused newspaper, uh, you've been you know, living in that environment for so long, and now you're here. And do you have a sense of American interest in China? Uh, certainly, you know, among your peers, uh, that's, that's definitely the case. But when you were standing in line at the DMV or wherever, uh, what was your sense of things? I think there's um, always, you know, when you mention that you live overseas, and especially in China, there's always a very warm and curious response. Um, but it is true that international news has been knocked off the headlines. Um, and I also think another thing I've learned here is that we need to do a better job of explaining international news. You know, it's easy for your eyes to kind of glaze over, you know, when it's the umpteenth iteration of something or when, you know, people don't have a good sense for the person who's attached to a given name. Um, so, you know, I think that we need to uh, present international news in a way that makes sense to people. Um, but also, you know, I, I think there is a enthusiasm and curiosity about the world, um, but definitely it's, it's not one that's uh, matched by familiarity. Yeah. No, I, I really just want to say thank you, Lucy, for joining us. I guarantee you uh, that nobody that was part of today's webinar had their eyes glaze over. Uh, you really brought uh, these questions to the fore. You explain things so clearly. And all I can do is, please come back. Please do this again. I hope you'll do that. Well, thank you very much, especially if I can do it in California. Lucy, thank you. Thanks, Clay.